passava agora a palavra ao meu querido amigo Hugh Greathead, é o diretor... Just a minute, Hugh, just a minute. <risos> é o diretor europeu da Prison Fellowship International, está cá a representar a Prison Fellowship International e, e vem nos dar um bocadinho do que é que é a nossa impressão digital no mundo, em mais de 120 países. Um, o Hugo já passou por várias experiências, uh, já esteve em África, já esteve em Moçambique, já viveu em Portugal, estudou no Colégio St. Julian's, Diz algumas palavritas em português e muito bem-vindo, Diogo. Am I on? Yeah. Okay. Great. Good afternoon. It's it's a real pleasure to be with you here and thank you so much for the invitation to be attending this Iberian Peninsula First Restorative Justice Conference. It is part of that great big ambition that Bruno has just been talked about. And I am sure that Bruno has seen over the previous years other people come and go with great ambitions. But as he mentioned, so many projects just come to a stop. But I think that this has so much more to offer because we are not just working within the Iberian Peninsula, we are working within the European community. We are working across Europe and Central Asia and furthermore, across the whole globe. So my job this afternoon is to give you a little bit of a taste in what we are doing and some of the challenges we are facing to build this really amazing future. But before I begin, maybe some people would like to get a headset who don't understand English so well. The other little thing that we might just do before starting off is just to stand up and shake ourselves out a little bit. I can see some people suffering from the vino that was drunk over lunchtime. So maybe let's just stand up and shake our arms out. It's okay. We can do that. Do you guys just want to stand up a moment? Shake your arms out. Yeah, that feels a lot better, no? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, this is probably a little bit countercultural, but <laughs> I want to start off with this little slide here. When people think of prisons, when think, people think of crime and punishment, suddenly these stereotypes come up. They think when they're going to go into prison, they're going to see something like this. A rough, tough, mean-looking guy. Maybe a little bit crazy. Probably a lot of tattoos. And kind of a scary place to be. That is part of the battle in bringing restorative justice to society. What's the actual reality we face when we go into a prison? We see a group of people that we honestly probably couldn't distinguish. Who is the criminal? Who is the offender? And who is the volunteer? I'm not going to challenge you now, but from this picture, it would be interesting for you to identify who you think the offender is and who you think the... Um, the victim is here. One of the most amazing observations that people have for the first time, volunteers have for the first time in going into prison, is when they come out and they say, wow, when I looked around, any one of those people could have been me. And I could have been them. So, our founder, Chuck Colson, was that little boy up in the right-hand corner there. But he turned into an offender. 
because he came, he started working with President Nixon. He was a very powerful man working in the background. And the team came to believe that the ends justify the means. And even being close to the president wasn't enough to escape justice. So he went to prison, and whilst he was in prison, his Christian faith grew, and he got to know a lot of prisoners in the process. And he did a lot of talking and encouragement, did a lot of encouraging with, with those prisoners. And he promised he would come back to help them in some way. And the way Chuck Colson did that was to found Prison Fellowship. And he founded Prison Fellowship USA in 1970. And it was there to help prisoners find a new hope. Because whilst people are alive on this earth, we have to believe that a minus can be turned into a plus. We have to believe that the people who are going to come out of prison can go back into society and contribute positively to that society. Not just exist, but to thrive as well. Part of um, the process of bringing justice to society, bringing the subject of justice to society, I think, is starting to find the language that people can understand. I am new to the crime and justice field. I've worked for 20 years. Um, as Louise said, in many countries around the world, in humanitarian relief and development work. And much of that was involved with growing organizations. And particularly growing the resources for organizations to do more of what they believed they were called to do. And part of growing resources is to help people to understand what you are trying to achieve. It's the common story of marketing. And one of my observations with the whole restorative justice field is that we use words that most people just don't understand. Justice in itself is a, is a loaded word, restorative can mean so many things to so many different people. What does it actually break down to? How can we describe that to the mum and dad, to the retired person, to the child out there who can join our ministry through not only volunteering, but also giving their money towards growing our organizations so that we can do more work. And probably the first step to getting the language right is to make some very simple goals and outcomes. These are not used for marketing, but they start to describe, I hope, the work we are trying to do, which can then be converted to language that more people can understand. So we aim to restore individuals and communities where they have been affected by crime and imprisonment. Everybody, just about everybody in this room has been affected by crime in one way or another. Every one of our communities has been affected by crime in one way or another. And we know that Every time a bad story happens, and there's more than one a day, it hits the headlines. 
we are so privileged in the field of work that we are working that the public is already interested in what we are doing. That's nothing like humanitarian and development work where we have to really fight to find space for the public to hear what is happening in other parts of the world, other unknown parts of the world. Our challenge is how do we convert this ready-made interest in crime and punishment into a subject area where people feel empowered. When they hear that story, how can we draw them in to a situation where they feel they can become partners towards a solution? We want to see a situation where offenders are taking responsibility for their past, past actions and future lives. They need to be successfully reintegrated into family and community. We've talked about them seeking to repair the harm they have caused with victims. Um, starting to contribute positively to their communities and leading others towards positive lives, better lives. You know, I think of an organization like Alcoholics Anonymous. The best people to help an al alcoholic to get off drugs, I mean off alcohol, is an alcoholic himself or herself. Because they realize that it's a constant journey, it's a constant battle. They have experienced the challenges, the deep challenges and the pain themselves in their journey towards getting off alcohol. So, the same thing with a reformed offender. What better resource do we have within our communities to draw out and come alongside those other children and adults who might fall into the same pattern of life? Or who already have gone into that pattern of life, but have not yet been caught. And this is another important area that I think needs to challenge us. When society thinks about criminals, they only think about that first slide I showed you, the ones in prison. Those are the ones they want to stay in prison forevermore, to lock them up and throw away the key. But for every one of those guys and girls that is in prison there, there's a whole lot walking around amongst us. But because they have not been caught, ah, it seems to be okay. We work a lot with children, children of prisoners. We desire to see them grow in fullness of life and to have an opportunity to develop their skills and talents. You know, in working with children and families outside prison and keeping them connected with their family members in prison is one of the single, is probably the single most effective tool within the overall toolbox that we work with that reduces the likelihood of them reoffending later on. And I think Bruno was sort of alluding to this, that it's not just about having restorative com conversations. There's a whole package. And Dr. Um, Dr. Jerry as well today, Professor Jerry was um, saying exactly the same thing. Restorative justice conversations are an important part of a change process. I, I was talking um, just uh, over, over lunch. You know, I've been working in South Africa for the last three years. And um, over the last two decades, I've had a lot of work down in Southern Africa. And I watched the peace and reconciliation process unfold. And I have watched where the peace and reconciliation process is today. 
And whilst the peace and reconciliation process put South Africa on a very solid foundation to build a strong and bright future. What is happening today is that the nation is throwing away that rich heritage that began then. The pain of apartheid is coming back and there is nobody working and continuing to work towards reconciliation. These things are a lifelong journey and they can even carry on from one generation to the next. We would love to see victims seeking justice and experiencing restoration. As already mentioned, um, we are working in 120 countries across the world and given that there's just about, depending on definition, 232 countries globally, it means we cover a significant area of the globe. To make it a little bit more um, real, within the countries that we work, there are some 12,200 prisons. And globally, as far as I can find on the internet, and I'm in the process with our different partners in mapping every one of those prisons across the world, there's only about 16,000, 17,000 prisons across the world, depending on definitions. 17,000. It's nothing. It's nothing, guys. Yeah, nothing. 16,000 people don't even fill a big football stadium. This is a challenge that we can start to reach we could reach theoretically and have some sort of program in every single prison across the world to think that the people sitting in those 16,000 or 17,000 prisons represent much of the fear that the rest of society lives in. This is something we can do. And that's what challenges me. How do we make what we can achieve into a message that the vast majority of people around the world can get behind to help build safer communities and a happier society in which we can all live? We are driven by Christian volunteers and are funded by individuals, churches, foundations, and some government grants as well. Um, I'm going to go through the following slides quite quickly. Um, our overall ministry covers these different areas of, of, of work. Restorative justice, we've heard a lot about sycamore tree. Restorative conversations, building bridges. The important thing here is that we try to follow best practice. And we have different courses, different modules developed using best practice, but they are all adapted to local context. And the other area is communities of restoration, which our um, PF president for, for Portugal talked of yesterday in the time he spent in Brazil, where it's called a PAC. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Prison Fellowship does quite a lot of work with halfway houses. Um, those places where people coming out of prison can have a place to put their head at night, a place where they can find work before they go alone back into society. And we also do programs in preparing people to leave prison. We have extensive Christian ministry. Um, one of the key programs we have is the prisoner's journey. I'll touch on that a little bit more. And also, as mentioned, our children of prisoners programming. 
And one of the most famous programs that many of our ministries run is called Angel Tree. Again, it's a very simple and beautiful program that people love to support. Because fathers and mothers in prison, they don't have cash. They don't have money to buy their children a present. And those children start to think that their mother or father doesn't really care for them. And what we do with this program is to ask those mums and dads in prison, what would your child really love for Christmas? We write that down and we will go to churches, we can even go to in shopping malls and ask people or put a note up, who would like to buy a present for this child? This is the present, this is the name of the child and they will buy that present, give it back to prison fellowship. We give the parent the chance to write a note to the child and that present is given by the parent to the child. It is such a powerful ministry, both to the parent in prison and to the child as well. So simple, so effective. And that is some of the challenge that we face in how to break down restorative justice programming into pieces so that those who cannot be volunteers out there in the public can still join the ministry through supporting some parts of the ministry. I always say this, the water comes for free, but the plumbing costs money. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about statistics behind Sycamore Tree. And, you know, you can have results showing that it's highly effective, results showing that it's not very effective at all. But as made very clear through the course of the past two days, let's not try to associate all of the success or all of the failure of our programming to just one program, which is Sycamore Tree. Sycamore tree is just one type of tree in a big forest that has lots of different types of tree. And if we can get a story just like this, which is a very common one from a victim, I wanted revenge, but I found compassion. That's a success. If we can hear something like this, from an offender. Today I looked in the mirror and I see an offender that wants to change. If our program has brought an offender to see for the very first time that he or she is an offender, that is a success. And the second thing, if they make a decision for the first time in their life that actually I don't like the way I have been, I want to change. That is a huge success. It doesn't mean to say that that offender is suddenly transformed for the rest of their lives. It's like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. There was great stories of forgiveness and compassion exhibited during that commission. But over time, some of that hurt and pain, some of that broken, some of those broken lives and some of that damage to society, it still has a life and it starts to grow back. So even people who have been on Sycamore Tree program, they might still go and reoffend again and again, but they started on a journey during that first sycamore tree program. And maybe it has meant they stayed out of prison just a few days longer. And remember this, another part that we don't calculate, I think, is that 
Every day longer that somebody stays out of prison is part of our impact. Because every day somebody is in prison is costing the taxpayers money. Our restorative justice program is, is backed by our Center of Excellence, uh, the Center for Justice and Reconciliation. That's the website. It has hundreds of thousands of visitors every year, mostly students and, um, and academics who make use of that very rich um, resource of, of, of literature. Communities of Restoration, or APAC, uh, it's a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week intensive prison regime. Um, operated by Prison Fellowship. And it is designed to reduce offending behavior through character-focused, faith-based programming. It is part of restorative justice. Uh, it was started in Brazil. It's, it's extended out to 23 countries. Where I live in Germany, um, Sehaus, which is Prison Fellowship Germany, has its headquarters, and I spend quite a lot of time in um, that community of restoration for youth offenders. And it is amazing to see the journey that those youth go on in their one year, one and a half years they spend in that center. I wish I could say that, oh, they come to Sayre House, after two weeks they are transformed people and everybody lives happily ever after. It doesn't work like that. It's rough, it's tough. And a lifetime of pain, a lifetime without living in community. Often a lifetime where they've experienced very little love is not changed through just a few days or a few weeks or maybe even a few months of programming. It can be a journey. And we start and we help those um, offenders along that path. The Prisoner's Journey is another um, important program for us. It is, it is not about evangelism. It's about taking prisoners through a journey through the book of Mark and giving them the skills to read that book, to explore verse by verse what it is saying and bringing them to a point where they can start to read the Bible and hear what it might be saying to them and making their own decisions in a very clear and calm way. It's a beautiful program. And we are aiming to roll it out in um, 60 countries and reach over a million prisoners by 2020. I've talked about our Children of Prisoners program. Um, One of the parts that I didn't talk about is our international program on this, where people within um, more prosperous countries, richer countries, can sponsor a child of a prisoner in one of the less developed countries. Um, again, it's another way that we can start to bring the public on board with feeling like they can do something about the social problems caused by, caused by crime. And it's something that is new to Prison Fellowship International and we're working on developing. Now, again, um, it's been talked of a number of times uh, through the last two days. Why would you want to support an organization like Prison Fellowship? What makes us special? We can talk about the theory as well as anybody else. We can talk about policy as well as everybody else. In fact, probably the other people can talk about policy and law a lot better than us in many circumstances. So why would you want to involve Prison Fellowship International? Why would we want to involve civil society and other NGOs that are working in this sector? 
And it's all about our volunteer qualities. Sure, we need the budget, we need the policy framework, we need official commitment. Absolutely essential. Sure, we need best practice. And if I am to be brutally honest, maybe we spend a lot of time talking ourselves into the ground about policy and best practice. But it's the volunteer qualities that often start the journey. Because our volunteers, they feel compassion. And we believe that every human being, so long as they have breath, have a chance to give something back. Because each one of us are created in the image of God. Our volunteers have commitment and they show love through their perseverance. And I'm, all, all, I'm, I'm so often struck when I go into a prison and the prisoners say, for the first time, somebody is coming in and spending time with us as a group. Your volunteers, they could be out enjoying themselves on that Saturday or on that evening. None of us here in prison choose, would choose to be here. But you, you're choosing to be here for nothing, for free. We are cut out from society, but society has come to visit us. And keeping in mind that so many of our prisoners have lived in isolation, they have lived without love, that act of visiting people in prison and spending time with them week after week is what rarely starts to open their hearts to go on that restorative justice journey. So there might be volunteers, but as I said earlier, the water comes for free. The water comes for free. But the plumbing costs money. If I look at the rollout of restorative justice moving forward, we've got to find ways to fund the plumbing. We have got to find ways to make restorative justice come alive, not just to a small group of enthusiasts like we have here today but to the whole nation we need to create a movement where each one of us believes that we can play our part to making society a happier and more positive place i believe we can do it And I am looking forward to carrying on this journey with each of you. Thank you very much. You. Can you put your headphones, please? Muito obrigado. Dizíamos há bocado ao almoço que há dois anos que estás na Prison Fellowship e que estás a fazer um excelente trabalho. E, e isto é a prova de que, de que a Prison Fellowship está no caminho certo e que isto, isto vai, vai, vai ter um rumo e já está a ter um rumo, está a ter um foco. Thank you.